<laughs> Do you know 50% of your millionaires won't pay more than 400 bucks for a suit? 40 something percent of your millionaires will not buy new shoes, they'll have them repaired. They're driving cars that are three years and older, and they buy them used in the first place. You've got a client here that comes here, um, Dan, named JC Preciado. And now he's been, he's, he's on my program for a whole year type of thing. And so he works at some pretty high end dealerships, and he said, I asked him, we were out wholesaling one day, and I said, JC, I said, You've got Range Rovers, you've got Porsches, you've got Mercedes, you've got all these high-end cars. I said, really, when it comes down, because he's in the accounting department, when it comes down to the affordability, what's the percentage of people that can actually afford these things? He says, less than 10%. Mm -hmm. And the number one vehicle, what do you think the number one vehicle out there that is leased by broke people? Porsche. Porsche is number one. Okay. However, Millionaires think a little bit different. Roy's, you know what, I'll be honest with you. I love, who loves a new car? We all love new cars, right? You love new cars, love them. open the door. Man, it smells new, it smells so great. I can't wait to get inside and drive it. You know what, I drive a, a beater truck all the time. I love my truck, I just drive things till they die. I drive around an Ultima, I push shopping carts out of the way with it, you know? I don't care. I'd rather put my money in something that's gonna grow, not something that's going to have bird stuff all over it. You know, we all love our new things. Now, Yes, uh, right now I'm restoring a 1970 Fastback Mustang. That's kind of cool. But uh, my one is going in places where it's just going to grow, not appreciate like crazy. Okay? Appreciation, your equity builder, tax benefits, reduces from a 20% capital gain to a 15% capital gain if you structure your business properly. Apply profits to pay down the principal and increase your cash flow. So here's the thing. A lot of people will get a couple cash flowing properties going on. The next thing you know, they've got maybe a thousand bucks a month coming in and net cash flow. Thousand bucks. That's great. You know what they do with that thousand dollars? Oh, they're buying the next PlayStation. They got their new TV going on. They got spinning rooms on their truck. That's what they're doing with their money. Why not take that thousand dollars and apply it to the principal, all that cash flow, and apply it to the principal of your loan so you can have the house paid off in seven years? Because that's what it'll come out to. Why drag it out 30 years when you can have it done in just a little over seven years? That makes better sense than me. Right? So keep your job if that's what you love to do. Live off of that. Take your cash flow. Reinvest it in the properties you already have. So that way you've got five free and clear properties. I don't care what type of market you're in. It feels good to have five free and clear properties, does it not? I'll start thinking a little bit different. <laughs> Sell in 1031, just like we did in Monopoly, we just change them over, and turn them over, and build, and go bigger and better, okay? Here's the methods to use. You buy, rent, or sell. Lease options, seller financing, and fix and flips. Now, here's a long-term rental strategy. In order to obtain financial security, you must own at least $1 million in real estate and utilize all the benefits of the buy and sell and buy and hold strategies that are out there. Now, does this mean you should go to Montecito and buy one house for a million bucks? That's not very good and smart when it comes to investing. Okay, no, okay, wherever. <laughs> You're right, okay. Yeah, so you buy, you know, it, may, it might have wheels, but you know, you still got a house for a million bucks, right? That's not the way to go. A million dollars can get you a whole lot of really, really good properties. Now, they would include equity, which is the appreciation principal pay down. It's going to include the cash flow, which is what you need. You need the leverage, the financial leverage. It'd be much better in my mind to take $500,000 and go buy 10 or five houses in different areas so they perform differently. So I, when the economy does change, my income streams are balanced out versus buying one property locally. Tax sheltering, wealth building strategies. Now, basically what it boils down to using the short and the long term strategies is options. Options, don't we all want options? Do I get the HMO or the PPO? Or am I just getting, getting what Obama gives me? I want options, I want to be able to choose what I'm going to buy or sell or invest in. Not what I'm told. 
So here's your wealth building methods to be used. Purchase several single family residences. Why? Because they appreciate the best. You want your portfolio to grow, you want your net worth to grow, houses. Think about Monopoly. What do you buy first? Houses. You collect rents, you build the equity, you eventually sell them off when they're worth more and trade them up into something bigger and better, right? 1031 a few of those houses into multifamily housing and then 1031 some of those into your apartment buildings and or commercial if that's what you're after. And I recommend to keep a complete balance, a complete balance once you get to this level of all different types of real estate because when, when houses are appreciating, commercials typically not. Commercial always follows single family houses. So when single family houses are crashing, then you can figure the, the tail end caboose of a roller coaster, commercial is now following the houses. They're always a little bit behind. But here's the thing, you can buy you know, yourself a really good strip center and it's got a uh, uh, you know, good cap rate, good ROI, but the problem is, is that most of your commercial properties, the vacancy lasts so much longer than a house would ever last. And now you're just like, oh my gosh, you better have some big bank to keep those things afloat. What are you inheriting if you climb up the scale there? Your cash on cash return, including financing, on a single family home in a good market could be 10 or 12 percent. For an apartment building, cap rates are going to be 14 to 16. It all depends on which market you're in. So, Let's say, for instance, if we're in the LA County area right now, okay? Um, if you're going to be looking at an apartment, you'd be lucky if you got five cap rate. Okay? You're going to be in between the two and five cap rate. And you know what? It's a very tight market. People are killing each other over these commercial or multi unit buildings. However, you know, I can move that same building over to like Kansas City, Missouri, and that thing will probably produce, you know, like a 12% cap rate. Most of your cap rates, whether it's a, on, let me back up. Most of your cap rates nationwide right now on uh, multifamily housing and commercial are going to be right in between that, that 12 and 14 percent cap rate nationwide as a whole. Okay, but once we start hitting the localized markets or the primary markets, that's going to drop dramatically below six. And when we're in the secondary markets, that's going to be more like a right around the 12 percent cap. Whereas for houses. Kind of the same thing. If we're in the local market, Southern California, for a house, you're looking in between the two and the five percent cap, and then we can take that same house and go to a secondary market like Kansas City and Indianapolis, and you'd have like a nine or a ten, but a real strong nine, ten is starting to slip. Ten we can get at the beginning of the year, but ten right now is going to be a tough one. Now this also depends on am I in a low income neighborhood, working class neighborhood, or am I in a middle income neighborhood? I don't do any low income. I like to collect things. Okay, so I work strong, working class neighborhoods were better. Commercial storage units, how do you feel about that? I love commercial storage units as long as you don't have a whole lot of competition. Because you can be in a great market where the economy is booming. What happens when the economy is booming? We're swiping that credit card. We're buying a lot of junk, aren't we? We can't put it in our house, so where are we going to store it? Oh, storage unit. Oh, but the market now crashes. And now I can't afford my mortgage payment. i got to store my junk. Oh, perfect time for a storage unit because you're going to go rent it. So whether it's an up market or a down market, storage units are great. In fact, they're one of the easiest commercial buildings to get a loan for. So, sorry to stick on this. The, so I'm going to get the same return for a 20-plex apartment complex as I would for buying 12 single-family homes. Why would I want to inherit the extra risk of the one big roof? Oh, that's great. Oh, oh the one big roof? Which, which roof are you talking about? The multifamily. Multifamilies look riskier to me. With they are riskier. Less upside. They are. A lot of people love them because that's right. what they show on the infomercials. I would rather have the 12 houses versus the multi units. You know why? Because, let's say for instance, you know, too many cheeseburgers and pizzas going on in here. Okay? And they say, you know, I've got some big health issues and now my insurance is not covering this or that and it's being really expensive. And I need to pull some money. Where am I going to get money from? My investments. So now I've got a choice. If I only own a 20 unit apartment complex or I have 12 houses, I got to sell something. Now if I've got the 20 units, I have to sell the whole darn thing to be able to pull the money out. But I don't need all the money, but that's what I have to do. Or if I only need a little bit of that money, I only have to sell maybe four or five of the houses and I get to keep the other ones. Better exit strategies. Remember I said getting in? You need to know how to get out before you get in. That's what's key. 
So it's easier to liquidate houses than it would be a commercial building anytime. Because who do you think you have more buyers for, a house or a multi-unit? House. What's going to be easier to pay cash for, multi-unit or house? House. What's easier you're going to get a loan, house or multi-unit? House. Better exit strategies. What's going to appreciate better? House. What's going to cash flow? Really pretty much the same right now in today's market, or maybe a little bit less, but pretty darn close? House. To me, the house is the better way to go right now, because nationwide, it's about $45,000 per door on an apartment complex. Well, I can get a house, a turnkey, in a better neighborhood for 45 grand. Better exit strategy. Better wealth builder right now. It's not always going to be like that. That's so that's the reason why I recommend upgrading to right. it's com Because we're not always going to be in this market. There will be a time where you know you say, you know what, possibly you may say, I don't want to own properties all over the states and have to do this type of management. I'm now getting into my golden years, I'm going to consolidate, and I would rather just have everything right here in whatever town we're using. I don't know. Some people just love multi-units. There's nothing wrong with multi-units. It's just, just know the more units you have, the more transient your tenants are, too. You actually have more headaches with multi-units than you do houses. So, so it's completely up. It's, it's strategy. Do you want cash flow? Do you want appreciation? Do you want a combination of both? What are you, what are you looking to do? So if you're looking to retire and just, you know what, I've got a couple right now that's you know, in the early 70s that uh, are now retired and they are taking money in their IRA and they're buying a mobile home park. And so I'm coaching them along because they just want that mobile home park as a cash flow asset. They don't want to manage houses and be all over the place. And the mobile home park is close to them. Out of all the different investments, which would you say would cause you to have to travel the most? Oversee or deal with multi-units, multi-units, commercial or multi-unit, multi-units for sure because you got just a lot more tents. Commercial is not so much. Yeah, multi-units for sure. That would be the one that's kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, the headache. But they're very profitable too. You know, for the right price. So let's take a look at some examples here. You got an Indianapolis property, right? Three bedroom, one bath, almost 1,400 square feet, 49.9 is the purchase price. And here, you know, you can see all the deductions going all the way down, 20% down payment. Now, here's the thing. you got a cash on cash return of 31%, right? Now, what's important to me is this number, but also is important is, remember, if I get into something, how do I get out of it? I know I can sell it if I need to. It hits my affordability factor. It hits my cash on cash return factor. And then it would cost me 90 bucks a square foot to build this house. That means if I were to rebuild this house, it'd be a little over $122,000. But what did I get it for? $49,900. It's $36 a square foot, basically. And that's a good deal. Giving me cash flow, giving me exit strategy, giving me the affordability factor. In the fastest growing city east of the Mississippi. Let's take a look at Las Vegas. Okay, so we're back here, 1990. And you can see uh, as the red line says the United States, the blue line means Las Vegas. Okay, Las Vegas is kind of all over the place in regards to the steady red line for the United States. Then they appreciate extremely well in 2004. Okay, now Phoenix is, is following right about here, California is following right about there. And then they basically just take that roller coaster dive, boom, all the way down here and just drop again all the way down the bottom. This is a volatile market. I like volatile markets. Okay, I can go in there and I can start flipping properties like crazy. I can also buy at the right time and collect this and sell if I need to. And uh, so it's, it's a good market for me. However, you can see that there's a big change here. Now, this is 2011. We're actually up, uh, let me see, we're actually right here, um, right around the 18th percentile for Las Vegas. So you can see, this little chart. Now, if we turn around and go to a Cleveland market, and you're like, you know what, I don't want to have to deal with stuff like this. It's just a little bit too much for me. Then we can skip over to the Cleveland market, and again, here you can see during the time, it didn't really drop much at all. They didn't get kicked between the legs like the Las Vegas market did. Why? This one's designed for appreciation. This one's designed for cash flow. It's totally going down. Steadily going down, yeah, in the recession, but you know what? It's already up here again, okay? But it's not like that. So it depends on your risk tolerance and what you're after. 
Here, you're going to pay on average 100 grand. Let's say in 2010, you're paying 100 100 grand for a newer house. Okay, uh, 100 in 2010 for a house over here, turnkey, you're going to be paying about 35,000 dollars. How much with Section 8? Uh, we do. I love Section 8. To be honest, uh, they pay on time. I don't really have it. They uh, they screen tenants really well. There are certain markets you gotta be careful with Section 8 uh, because they're just lazy. But most markets that have demand are really good. And what I mean by demand is a diverse economy. Vegas, linear economy. I don't like investing there. I offer properties in Vegas just because I have investors that love Vegas. And it's mostly my Chinese investors that love Vegas. I don't like Vegas. Okay? Linear economy. They only focus on one thing. Tourism. Gambling, really. And when gambling's down, everything is down. Because there's nothing else in Vegas. In fact, people think, God, there's a lot of room to grow. No, they're actually landlocked. They are in this little circle, and we buy in an area called the sea is what we buy. We buy in the sea, but they're actually mountainous all around. They're actually landlocked in this little area. So there will be demand in that part when they finish building out, but a very linear economy versus Cleveland is a very diverse economy. People don't think it is, but it is. They're very diverse in their economy. In fact, they're only like three hours away from Detroit, the Detroit linear automotive industry only. Cleveland, diverse because they supply automotive parts, whether it's the motor or I was going to say the handle for the door. But we don't have those anymore, do we? You know, and, you know, parts for doors or whatever it may be over there, but they also supply to airlines and cruise liners. And they, they're a very blue collar industry, and a lot of manufacturing of different things in regards to Cleveland. So they're actually going through a really big economic boom right now. And don't you see the taxes on the properties in Cleveland much less than in Detroit? It's really high. Uh, actually, no. Cleveland's actually pretty high too. So if I bought a property for forty-five thousand dollars turnkey in Cleveland, I expect my taxes to be about two grand. Really? Yeah. So that's kind of high. Right. But here's the thing: once what we do is once we buy that property, we've got that tax that comes along with it. But at the end of the year, we submit it in the county to get that assessed value down. That's what we do. Bring it down. So they're not like the 1% rule. Well, the rule is 1% property tax nationwide. They're higher than that. Okay? However, the cash flow is tremendous. And I'll show you. So here's one that's 1,500 square feet. This is turnkey, obviously. 45,000 bucks, pulls in $11,500 in gross rents, and um, uh, gives you a cap rate of 17.5%. That's really good. That's all netted out. Okay? So if you're looking for a good return on your investment, now a property like this is 45,000, but here's the difference between us and most other companies. Because we'll have investment companies that will buy houses on the same street that we're on, for example, they'll sell that for 65, dollars $70,000 strictly off the cash flow. And a 10% cap is what they're doing. And they can get it. But when we sell it, you're actually getting equity in it. Oh, there's a key thing to remember. So not only get cash flow, but you can get this thing because what we like to do with our investors, or what investors like to do is they like to buy these things. They'll sit on them for six months to a year, do a cash out refi, pull their money out. They have to have it appraised, pull that money out so they can make it liquid and go buy another one. Is what they do. They'll slap a loan against it. Okay? So here's the good. How do you stay away from the problem areas? Problem areas? I mean, I, I've looked at Cleveland and I, I know that the city is buying poor neighborhoods and boarding them up. I'm not familiar with any of those neighborhoods that the city of Cleveland is buying and boarding up. What I am familiar with is the city of Cleveland is um, doing a couple things. One, the inner city of Cleveland is not what we're buying. So that's like going downtown LA. We don't want to own a rental property over there, so we don't buy over there. Those are the areas where you're going to find up a lot of board houses. But they are the city that, like in a place called University Circle, uh, certain areas downtown. Uh, Cleveland cities or the county is actually going and boarding these houses up because they're expanding um, their territory, meaning that they're expanding the college, they're expanding their uh, commercial side of things, building that city up. So, let's say for an example, I just got back there from two weeks ago. I was there in the beginning of the year. Now, there's an area called Fourth Street that had no restaurants or anything on it. They just opened up like seven different restaurants. They opened up shopping. They just opened up a brand new casino all downtown area. But these houses here that you're seeing are in the suburbs. We buy in the suburbs. Here's what's different, everybody. This is kind of cool. At first, I didn't like it. But when you, if I owned a house, let's say I'm a homeowner in Cleveland, 
I decide I want to sell my home, I must contact the county of Cleveland first. Because what they have over there is called a POS, point of sale. The city or the county of Cleveland will come over and do a thorough home inspection on my property. And they will write everything up as if you're going to get a home inspection when you're buying a house, but more thorough. And it comes out to be like a phone book. So when I decide to sell, what's your name? Andrea. So if I'm selling my property to Andrea, Andrea now gets this point of sale, this inspection, and she can see everything that is wrong with this property. Now, when Andrea buys this property, the county is going to require her to fix everything on that report within a certain amount of time. Here's the thing. Let's say I bought the, let's say I sold the property to Andrea for $20,000. I'm just going to use easy numbers. $20,000. And the repairs on the house is $20,000. Well, if she's buying a house for me at $20,000, what does she have to come up with escrow? How much she got to pay at escrow? How much? Forty. dollars She's going to have to pay the repairs and the house at the same time at escrow. Why don't you have to pay Because I can sell as is. I don't have to. I don't have to fix anything up. The next person has to come in. If they're going to buy, they have to beautify. So now I, she's got to come in and she's got to pay the forty dollars Twenty grand comes to me, twenty grand goes in the escrow account for this, the county of Cleveland. They hold that money. Now, they also must approve the estimate of repairs from the contractor. Must be a licensed contractor. They will meet the contractor and say, you must do these items first before we give you a draw. So not only that, maybe the contractor comes out and spends five grand of his own money. So now we're into it for $45,000 without any repairs yet. Then they'll come back and inspect, make sure everything's done, then they'll give them a draw of five grand and pay them off. See, so now we've got Big Brother in the county of Cleveland. Because what they're trying to do is this. They want to differentiate themselves from all the other markets, like in Detroit. They don't want to be a depressed town. They're going through an economic boom for the last two and a half years. They want to beautify the neighborhoods and the suburbs. They're not doing this in the inner city of Cleveland, just the suburbs. Because they want to shine above everybody else. So what does that do for the investors like you guys? It's a good thing. Because too many people all over the states and especially Cleveland, that's why the county stepped in, is that if, you, if I were to buy a property over in Cleveland, they want to make sure that I'm not being ripped off by the contractor or by the seller or the investment group that's selling that property. They're making sure the monies are going the right place and that house is getting fixed up. That's what they're doing. So, you're all now secure, which is a good thing. So, I've got a program called Remote Rehabs. It's through Black Belt Investors. And basically, what we do is we find wholesale deals for the investor. Wholesale deals to where they're equitable, we'll find them, we'll help you buy them, we'll turn around and rehab them for you, and then we'll offer the options of leasing, the lease option to buy, we'll do the seller financing, and or the rentals, okay? So we're basically doing all the research for you, crunching the numbers, which is one of the harder things for investors to do, it's not just numbers in regards to the value and, and rents, but also the local area um, economics as well. We'll order all the rehab estimates, and we don't like to say, hey, we got all these things to fix, here's a number. We itemize everything else so you know exactly what you're paying for. Okay? We've, uh, we'll hire the contractors for you once you approve everything. We'll overview the work, so that means we keep feeding you information, whether it's through video or through photos, so that you can see the progress of the work being done. Then we'll turn around and list the property for you, either for lease options, seller financing, and or uh, as a rental. I mean, we've absolutely built the best power team professionals uh, that work for you. A lot of investment groups out there you know, doing something similar, and a lot of them all also copy our model because we've been doing it much longer than everybody else. Okay? We've done basically all the work, and you are collecting all the profits. So, where are people getting the money? Dad mentioned it. What about their IRA? People are tapping into that because you're not earning a whole lot. What about your 401k? What about the money that's sitting under your mattress? Those are the things that you need to start tapping into because to me, you know, if you have, anybody ever read The Richest Man in Babylon, the other gentlemen said, hey, what are those books? That was the book that stuck in my mind in high school. Richest Man, I hated reading, hated reading. The back book, oh, I ate it up. And it says in there that your dollar should be acting as a slave. Go to work for you to build more dollars. And so we need to tap into our sources that we already have of that's not earning anything for us, or not performing as well for us, and put it in something that's performing. 
Check this out. Since 1985, only 4% of the mutual fund managers beat the S&P 500 index. Wow, really? That's from Fortune magazine. So here's the thing. Take a look at this pie. You've got to figure out where you're going to be when it's time for you to retire. Which slice are you going to take? Are you going to be 45% partially dependent on relatives? Ooh, that hurts. Right. Dependent on charity, 30%? probably take a charity over the relatives any day, right? <laughs> Still working at 23%? You work until you die? Really? Or are you going to take that small little slice of 2% and start becoming self-sustaining? Does it really take that much effort to be in that red slice right there? No, it doesn't. You know what it takes? Getting off your assets. Putting your money somewhere where it's supposed to be. Little clip, how's your 401k? That was last year, now it's a 401k. So here's the capital needed. You can use your money towards a joint venture if you want. We put partners together all the time. Let's say, for instance, four of you said, you know what, I'd like to buy a property and we'd like to sell in the next three years so we can buy a property, fix it up, put it on a lease option, and the property's 100 grand turnkey. Each of you come with $25,000, we'll put all the paperwork together to make sure your joint venture is all safe and sound, you know exactly your job duties, and where your money's going and what to expect. So basically you're tapping into greater resources of minds and pockets, really, sharing the expense and the risk, and plus sharing the profits. And it could be a long-term relationship or it could be a short-term relationship. So it's one of the great ways to be able to get your foot in the door, honestly. Is that joint venture a little bit different than actually going out and getting four or five people to come in on a loan, which, as you know, is more difficult for government scrutiny and... We, we try to keep cash. Okay. You got 25 in cash, 25 in cash. People say, I can't afford $75,000 property. I only got 25,000 bucks. Great, we'll start putting you guys together. Hold this property, hold it for a couple of years, Hit an appreciating area, sell it in two years, now you're walking away with $140,000. And there's no loans involved. You own a property free and clear. So you're not pooling loans, you're pooling joint ventures. That's right. totally different. Yeah. That's right. Okay. okay? It's all about getting your foot in the door. People are too busy sitting on the sidelines thinking, well, I need more education. I need more money. I need a better job. I need this. I only have X amount of dollars. You know what? We're doing a hard money loan right now for a lady that's an interior decorator, has no real estate experience whatsoever, and even rents an apartment. She found a property over in Malibu. Property's expensive in Malibu? Darn right they're expensive in Malibu. It's a short sale. She got it approved at $1.3 million. I about fell over. Why? Because it's worth $2.7 million. She got it approved for $2.3 million. She came to us and said, you know what? We would like, or I would like, to buy this house, fix it, and flip it. But she has no money whatsoever. She doesn't have money for a down payment. She doesn't have money for an earnest money deposit. How easy of a loan is that going to be? Not very easy, unless it's worth 2.7 and she got it for 1.3. And it needs $400,000 in rehab. So you know what we did as hard money lenders? We funded 100% of the deal. The difference the thing is, is that we put a project manager in place because we're not going to let her handle it. She doesn't know what she's doing. You know what she's going to get out of this whole deal? About 100 grand. 100 grand for just finding the deal. That's really good. But we funded. She even asked us money if, if we can keep her cell phone bill on. That's how bad it is. But you can have a smoking deal like that, 100% financing. Things are out there. You just got to look. So my recommendation to you is turn off Dancing with the Stars and start looking for some real estate. You can also tap into hard money lenders, typically 30, 20 to 30%. The other gentleman in here said he also has hard money lending ties. 35% to me is a little bit too high, but typically 20% down will do it. And uh, you're looking at somewhere between 12 and 18% interest only loans. 18% is something usually that our investors are using when they're buying at the auction. Much, much higher risk there um, versus buying a local residential property that we can go through a regular escrow or whatever you charge for. Okay? Absolutely charge your points. Okay? Uh, with the exception of Phoenix, we charge a flat fee of just 900 bucks. Everywhere else we charge points and we loan nationwide. Just depends. I don't have one cookie cutter system. I just don't. A lot of people say you can pick A, B, C, or D plan. Uh -uh. I base it off of the deal first, the person second, 
and then we'll figure out what our fee structure is because we want to make sure the deal works for you. Okay? Typically six months in uh, loan terms, origination fee and points, just like I answered right now. Or if you want to go down to you know your local Wells Fargo and pick up a loan, you can definitely do that. They're just not as investor friendly. They're going to want you to get a turnkey property, not a wholesale deal, where it's going to need some rehabs with 